11. It's an irreversible birth. John 3, 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee that you must be born again. It's, it's an irreversible birth. So you're not going to make decisions that have you to walk out of God's love. When you got it, it's over. All right? Or else you make God a liar. And I'm just not willing to walk down that road with you. Sorry about that. You're going on your own there. But um, we're looking at Psalm 119, 133. If I can find it. And it says, Order my steps. Look at this. In thy word. What? We have David here praying that God will help him stay close to his word. And when I'm reading your Bible, God, can you help me to understand it? You know, this is where the whole perverted Bible thing came up. Oh, I just can't understand that Bible. Have you thought about praying before you open that Bible? Have you thought about asking the Lord of the Word of God to reveal the Word of God to you? Remember, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for they're spiritually discerned. You remember that? So when you're kind of in your flesh, and it's like, well, I guess I'll read my Bible. Like, you got to slow down, buddy, because God's not going to open up that thing to you when you're like that. Or you're going to open it, and it's going to say, thou art the man, and you're going to close it and run. You know, I mean, weirder things have happened. <laughs> you know, but... This is a book that we need to be in communion with the Lord for God to open this book. And that's not disrespectful. That's just how it is. I think, I think you're probably a lot of the same way. You know, if, if your spouse or a family member or even one of your kids comes up to you, look, I need 50 bucks right now. You turn around, walk out my front door, close the door behind you, knock, if I choose to open the door, come in here with a different attitude. You see? I mean, you're, you're very much the same way. And, and sometimes we rip open the Bible and we're like, I need an answer right now, God, and it's on my time right now, like a microwave. Five minutes, go! <laughs> and God laughs at you and just like, I think we got the roles a little bit reversed right now. Amen? I'm the one that counts your steps. Your little Apple watch isn't even sufficient to know because I, I started counting at your first steps. Your Apple watch started when you put it on your, your little wrist, your little fleshy wrist, you know, and you probably paid too much for that Apple watch. You probably could have supported a missionary with all that money. But anyway, but you know, look at a Psalm 121. In verse 3, Psalm 121 and verse 3, He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Look at that. You know, I mean, you get into studying some of the spiritual warfare stuff or whatever, which I don't really recommend too much of. Be simple concerning that which is evil. You don't need to know too much of that stuff, okay? But you'll hear somewhere along the line, the devil doesn't sleep. Well, amen, the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't sleep either. Amen? And he keeps the devil in his place. All right? And if the devil's coming to me, he's got to go through the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? And that's not to say that the devil can't touch me and he's a toothless lion and I'll swing him around by the tail. No, no, no. I, that's Kenneth Copeland's stuff, okay? Uh, and you've seen what happened to his mind after he said that. That guy's gone. Okay? <laughs> the devil is, is already licking his... He already had that meal. He's looking for another. You know, the devil is a very large enemy. And I would say he's the second most powerful in the universe next to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I would say. And you don't come anywhere near that. Remember, you are a sheep. Don't come walking around like you're some tough person, even spiritually. I've met people that are like, oh, the devil ain't going to mess with I'm like, dude, whatever, man. I don't want to be anywhere near that when he finally gets, gets to take a lick at you. I don't want to be anywhere near that. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing that protects me. You know, and, and 
thank God that it's not based upon what I do to stay in good graces with Him. It's based upon what He did. All right? And I, He owns me. So what I do know is if He's going to allow that devil after me, He's going to be there to bind, me, bind up my wounds. Amen? He's going to be there in the lion's den with me. That's what I know. You know, that this world is not my home. That's what I know. And, and there's going to come a day where he may be getting victory over me today, but there's going to come a day where all that's over. And I'm going to be in my glorified body, and it's, it's all going to be history by then. And it'll never happen again. Amen? But my point in all that is just to encourage you that, yeah, even though the devil doesn't sleep, the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't sleep either. And he's the one looking after me. Amen? Uh, fourthly, I want to look at God's grace numbers our tears. Go to Psalm 56. Because remember, we're, we're talking about this, God's grace is numbered. And, you know, these, these uh, close friends and family of yours, they know your birthday. They know how old you are, how many years you've been married. I mean, they, they know what grade you were in when you, you know, did that funny thing that you got a nickname in high school for. And, and <laughs> they know all these things, you know, but God even knows more. And uh, we are in Psalm 56, verse 8. Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Now, when you're grieving, you need help, don't you? When you're grieving. But a lot of times, it's hard to receive grief counseling, I'll say, from somebody that's never been through what you've been through. That's true. That's true. Um, I found a, uh, I found in, in my life, and I won't give the names, but this individual, these individuals lost their son. He drowned in their pool. And as sad as that completely is, man, um, you know, my whole family was trying to minister to this couple, and it wasn't until this fellow walked in that he had lost a baby, that they sat down, and I don't ever want to know what that feels like, you know, but I'm, I'm just going to say that, that that fellow was able to minister to them much different than a house full of people that cared for them. You see? Everybody was there. Everybody's trying to, hey, let me cook something for you. Let me do this. Let us pay your bill. Like, whatever we could do, they're, they're trying to help them, um, encourage them. But it wasn't until somebody who came through some, with something very much similar, he could minister to them very different. I saw that. You know, and what I want to say is God knows what you're going through. And God does have this bottle. And He is, He is, He knows the number of tears you've cried Amen. from the beginning. You know, my mom tells me I didn't stop crying until I was about three, so He must have a lot of tears, you know, from me. But, you know, uh, but the thing is, God cares about those tears. And, and, could you imagine if somebody was there with you every time you cried, putting a bottle up to your eyes, grabbing those tears? Like, how acquainted with your griefs and your sorrows would they really be? Completely, right? I was there when that happened. I was there when that hardship happened to you. I was, look, they pull out that bottle. These are your tears when that happened. Like, what are you going to say to that? Nothing. Nothing. You were there with me, obviously. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's there with you. When nobody else can comfort you, He offers that comfort. Now, God, I wanted to say this before we move on, is God knows the tears of His children as if they were His own. How about that? I mean, you've been a parent, you've seen sick children... You look at those sick children and you're like, God, if there's any way I could take that sickness, just put that sickness on me. Take it off of that little life. Like that is the heart of a parent. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did for you. 
right? <laughs> Where judgment was hanging over your head and Jesus said, don't leave it on them. Put it on me. And that's exactly what he did. Can you run that to her for me? If... It's in Espanol. Something about Domingo. <laughs> Um, but God's grace numbers our tears. We're talking about grace proven with numbers. God's grace numbered. And lastly, I want to look at this. Go to uh, Philippians 4.19, New Testament. Philippians 4.19. And I know this isn't very deep stuff today, but this is practical stuff that you're going to need one day. You're going to need to know these things one day. You know, you may want to know how many toenails the Antichrist has. This is going to help you more than that, okay? You know? But God's grace numbers our needs. He knows exactly how many needs you have. Uh, we're in Philippians 4.19. It says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I want to point this out. That needs are not always what we want. They're just not. They're just not. I mean, you think about majority of the, of the countries in this world don't have half of what you have. Like, let's just, let's just put that on the table. And we get so acclimated to this climate and this country and how things are in our first world country that we forget you don't need half the things you have to exist. Amen? I, and I, I talk about it often, so I'm probably repeating myself, but when I went to Guatemala and I saw a Porsche dealership and we drove half a mile down the road and I saw a lady with three walls and a roof. And she's in there sweeping her dirt floor. That did something to me. I'm like, man, that lady loves her house, number one. Now, I know a lot of Americans, if all they had was three walls and a roof, they'd probably burn that thing down. They'd say, this is no home. But that lady, she was making that house a home. She's sweeping that dirt floor, man. They're going to have a clean place to sleep, man, as clean as it could ever be after she's done cleaning that thing. I've seen some people. We had, we had a next-door neighbor. It was a Hispanic couple. And, man, we, we were living in the dirt out on uh, Challenger Way and in Avenue H there at Briarwood Estates. And uh, the lot right next to us, it had a bunch of dirt. And this lady's out there with her broom. She's, she's doing her broom, man. And she's brooming, and there's dust going everywhere. I'm like, what does this lady think she's doing, man? She's not cleaning nothing. She's making a mess. I went out there the next morning. It was all hard dirt. She swept all that loose stuff away. And now she's got something almost like marble or tile to walk on. It's dirt, though. But you know what? She knew something I didn't know. Because <laughs> I'm thinking you can only accomplish that with concrete or, or with uh, putting bricks down and mortar between it and all that stuff. This lady's like, you know, you don't need none of that. You got a broom? You got a couple arms? Watch this. And you're not going to roll your ankle on that floor now. It's, it's hard ground to walk on. But you know, something tells me she didn't always live here. I had just a hunch. You know, or maybe her mom showed her this years ago. I don't know, man. But you don't need, as an American, you don't need half the stuff you got. And I venture to say this could be a trick from the devil to veer you off of what your mind should be focused on is things and stuff. Amen? Things and stuff. See, God's grace numbers our needs. And, and the Bible says, but my God shall supply all your need. That's not a Mercedes Benz, is it? It's not. I mean, it, 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 it's probably not even a fourth wall for your house. Let's just be honest. It's not a house at all, is it? There's people, there's many people in this world without a house. Many. 
So it, it ain't that. That's not, no, that's a need. I need that. I demand my rights. See, you're already off base. You have no rights. You have the right to remain silent, I've once been told. <laughs> anyway, um, well, I don't know how I got off on that, but uh, now you guys are going to check my record. I'm joking. I've never been arrested, although I should have been. I never was, okay? Um, yeah, good preaching. <laughs> Is that what you said? Oh, yeah, okay. Well, yeah, maybe that's to come, you know. But do you guys remember Elijah when he ran from Jezebel? We talked about last week. Go to 1 Kings 17, and I just want to bring you something here. And we're almost done, so bear with me. 1 Kings 17. And I want to look at verse 2 and 3. 1 Kings 17, 2 and 3, and let's start in verse 1. And Elisha the, Tish, the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Verse 2. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward. Look at this and hide thyself by the brook um, Cherith uh, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he delivered a message that he had to go run and hide after he delivered it. And God said, look, even though maybe your peers are going to think you're running and hiding, I told you to do it. So you listen to me. You don't think about what they are, are saying, okay? Follow me, and guess what? I'm going to provide for you. What? A mansion? No. Um, caviar? No, not at all. I'm going to give you clean water, and I'm going to get some unclean birds to feed you, okay? You ever thought about that? Ravens are unclean birds. Uh, you want to go into the Mosaic laws? Ravens are dirty birds. <laughs> I mean, don't we know that much, don't we? I mean, they are eating some nasty stuff. And Elijah's like, can I have like a better bird to drop off some food? And he's like, no, actually, no. Now that you ask, no. I want to show you that I can even use a dirty bird to do my work. <laughs> you know, that, that's my story. You know, I'm, I'm the unclean bird that God said, you know, I'll, I guess I'll use you anyway. You know, but there we go. But Elijah was guided by God into needing something. What? But I mean, on TBN... They always said, if I'm right with God, I'm never going to need anything. You know, I'm going to live high on the hog. No, no, you look in the Bible, God leads his followers into places sometimes where they need him. You know, and with our uh, first world, you know, credit card driven, whatever you want to call it, way we live, a lot of Christians never need God. They just slide the card. Never need God. And every once in a while, God will force that situation to show you, you still need me, kid. You, you know how he could do it? He could do it with your health, just like that. Money can't buy good health. And God will shake you up and wake you up and say, guess what? You haven't needed me for 15, 20 years, but you need me now. You know, there's some situations, everyone becomes a praying man. Right? You, you go through some, you, you will find yourself praying real quick in some situations. And that's just how it goes. And God, some, if God has to keep you at the foot of his cross by an infirmity, or else you won't stay there, if God has to keep you at the foot of the cross with some financial deficit, because you won't stay there otherwise, God has been known to do such a thing. 
He wants you at the foot of the cross. He wants you praying. He wants you caring about what saith the Scriptures. He wants your nose in the book. He wants your knees bended on the ground praying to Him. But needs are not always what we want. And uh, since we're on that, go to 1 Timothy 6.8. This will be our last verse. 1 Timothy 6.8. And this is a hard truth, which Jesus was known for saying many of them, but this is, this is, a, this is a hard truth that the Bible gives us, especially to, to an American. Other countries could swallow this bitter pill much better than Americans. And this is what it says. Well, let's start in verse 7. Actually, verse 6 is pretty good too. Let's go there. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Verse 8, our text here. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. What? What? But I need my three-piece suit. No. <laughs> Apparently, God doesn't think you do. Uh, I need... Uh, I mean, we, I've seen these episodes of the hoarders, you know, and this lady is looking at this empty shampoo bottle. She says, I don't know why, but I need this. And it's like, I don't know if she was paid to say that or something. It was like that ridiculous. And with the shows, you never really know if they're real people anyway. But I mean, that's kind of how we get. That's kind of how we get, isn't it? It's just like, no, you don't. Food and raiment. What is that? Food and clothing. That's it. That's all you really need. Now, who can raise your hand to say that God's given you much more? Psh, way more. Like, way more. I can't believe how much more than just food and raiment He's given me. And I don't deserve any of it. But you know, God gives His children good things, doesn't He? He sure does. And we're never going to be able to wave our finger in His face and say, but you didn't get... No, 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 no. You want to talk about needs, boy? Food and raiment. And <laughs> judging by the size of your belly, you had much more than you needed. <laughs> you know? And it's like, thank you, Jesus. Amen. It's true. It's true. You know, and uh, that's just God's grace. But um, God's grace is numbered, and I'm sure there's a lot more examples than I gave you than today. But since we, we started on that path last week of God's grace, I wanted to just take another moment to look at, at God's grace. And um, hopefully it would be a reminder to all of us of what we really need in this world. And then how God has exercised His love and kindness toward each of us. And hopefully it will pep you up a little bit, you know, to remind you that your Lord doesn't sleep. You know, if... Sometimes, I, I don't know, sometimes I wake up at night and I wonder if there's something in my house. I just wonder. And I don't know. And, and the first thing I always pray for is that God protect my child. And then, then my family. And then, you know, I, I, if I'm staying up, the first thing I'll do is I start praying for people in our church. You know, and like, I don't know what, as, as a pastor, it's, it's kind of hard to explain but I get woken up at night a lot, and I'll just lay there, and I'm like, is it me? Is it something? So I just start going to prayer, man. And uh, God knows what kind of flesh bag I am, so he's like, wake up! You know, like, okay, I'm awake. Let's do it, God, you know? And, uh, but that's how it is. But hopefully it's a good reminder about how, God, how well the Lord knows you. And even though He knows you that well, He still gives you His grace. You know, and if nobody else in this world could forgive you, the Lord Jesus Christ can forgive. And the Lord Jesus Christ can be that balm of Gilead and give that grace. Amen. And give you that hope to wake up tomorrow. 
Amen? Sometimes we need that. Sometimes we're like, why, why am I doing all this? What is all this for? You know what? That's why you need to be about something bigger than you. Right? Don't just serve your own flesh. Serve the Lord. Be part of something bigger. I mean, what is this life about, man? This life will soon be passed. Only things done for Christ will last. What are you really doing for Christ? Because I can tell you, He's doing a whole lot for you. Amen? All right, let's go ahead and stand.